Good morning and welcome. It is great to be together again. Praise the Lord that the weather decided to wait until after the service so that we're able to be back together again this morning. Um, so I definitely missed worshiping together as a church last week and um, it's good to be back. So let's get started. Let's start with some singing. Let's praise God. Let's worship him. We're going to be talking about how God is greater than the angels this morning, how Jesus is higher than the angels. And so we're just going to sing about that and celebrate that this morning. So let's stand. Let's worship him together. Just uh, praise you this morning that you are Lord of all, and that even when things seem so bleak and so heavy here, that we can rest in the fact that you are still in control, you are still God, you are still on your throne, and you are a great God, wrapped in splendor. You are eternal, you have been here from the beginning and beyond the end. And we rejoice that one day we will be able to worship you in person when we go to join you. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoices. He wraps himself in love, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his words, trembles at
Good singing, by the way. Uh, I'm Dwayne Martin, one of the elder team members, and uh, I'd just like to share the scripture with you, just with you this morning. And it says how great our God really is, Psalm 104, verses 1 to 4. O oh Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. Let's pray together. Lord, we just want to thank you now, especially this morning for the privilege of being here today and just for being able to honor you with our gifts and our offerings today as we think about your provision financially in each of our lives this week. And Lord, as we have given this week and give today, we just thank you for all that you provided. Bless our time together as we continue in worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Get ready. I am a priceless treasure. God knows me. God hears me. God is my comfort. To embark on an epic quest. Nothing better forgiven and chosen forever. And discover God's greatest treasure. I am a treasure. All right, so we are compressing two weeks of announcements into one. All right, so we're going to do this as a trio, and obviously Vacation Bible School stuff leads the way. So Jess, go right ahead. All right, so we are six months away from Vacation Bible School starting. We're going to do a one-day VBS again. Um, that seemed to work really well, and um, we're going to try again. So June 25th, we are asking um, for you to kind of save that date and we have a sign-up sheet coming around today. Just if you have any interest, oh, there I am, finally. Um, if you have any interest in serving and helping, there are lots of ways we need help, from setup to clean up to, like, hands in the, with the little ones. So, um, and I love your enthusiasm, but you can't help because you're going to come. Uh, so, <laughs> that will be coming around. That's our first thing. So, if June 25th, we're going to go 10 to 4 again. If you would like to sign up, that's coming. You want to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Keep on. Um, now a little closer to home. February 6th is a Sunday coming up in a couple weeks, and we would like to go to Black Coffee Caverns, which we think we discovered was originally called Baker Caverns, if you're from around here. Dwayne is confirming. Um, but I also hear that it's maybe not as treacherous to get into as it once was. I, I don't know. <laughs> but we're opening it up to everyone. It's been in the kids' email for a couple weeks. We are going to meet there at 2 o'clock that Sunday and explore the cavern. So if that sounds like something fun that you or your family or your kids or grandkids would like to do, um, we'd love to have you. I would love to know if we have, like, if you want to come and you don't get my emails, just maybe mentioning it to me. Because if we have too many people, I think we're going to split into two groups. So just to kind of have a heads up of a rough idea, even if you think, like, you may come, just, just holler at me and let me know that so we have an idea. But we'd love to have you explore the caverns with us just as a fun family event so okay cool so i i mentioned the caverns like i don't know end of last year december 26 or something and josh was like hey we're going there tomorrow because i know the people that own it and and i think i'd even mentioned how like far out trying to even get a, a date and a time was and josh was like well i know people um and so he like went and he knows people. And so we were able to nail down an opportunity. And um, so that's not directly youth ministry related, but it is Josh related. Um, but tying into that are some youth ministry related things. So Josh, what is what is next? Okay. Uh, first of all, if you have any jars, my, like my wife will want me to ask this. If you have any jars from the soup, from the chicken corn soup, if you can bring those back in for us to use again, that would be awesome. And there is still some chicken corn soup in the freezer that people have signed up for and have purchased or, or at least have signed up for. I will be down there after church uh, because, well, we didn't give it to you last Sunday because, you know, <laughs> Tim canceled on us. So, uh, um, but we are, we are doing another soup sale uh, right now it's going on. There actually is a QR code in your bulletin right next to the Alive Student Ministries. Uh, if you would like to scan that on your phone, it will take you right to the site. It will uh, allow you to purchase as many. You can buy it right there on the site. You can put your name in. If there's a youth, per particular youth you'd like to sponsor, you can put their name in. Okay, all that is on there. If you have any questions about that, you can come ask me. Julie has done an absolutely amazing job starting to get us into the 21st century. Uh, and so we're starting to do all of our, our youth sign up with the QR codes. If you would like the traditional sign up, there is one back here that you can put your name. And I, we just need to know when you plan to pick it up. 
Uh, it will be the 5th is when we are making it of February, and you can pick it up either that day or the 6th. And if you are planning on going and you to the, the caverns. caverns and you don't have time to run home and you want to buy soup, you can warm it up here and eat. Uh, if you just want to stay here and eat and hang out, yeah. you, know, you can stay here and eat and bring other food, pizza, whatever you want for your family. Uh, Lexi won't be doing like a soup kitchen for everybody. <laughs> but if you want to warm your own stuff up. Um, and so Tim expressed, and I want to make sure you guys understand, we're not like trying to start a soup kitchen. <laughs> okay, you know, we got other fundraisers coming up, and I know you can get soup for, for $10 and less other places, okay, but this is a, these are fundraisers for our teens uh, for a lot of amazing things. Uh, we're, we're spending the money on, on camp, we're spending the money on uh, Brother National Youth Conference, which is known as Momentum, and I mean, I know personally going to Momentum uh, affected my life immensely. Uh, with, with the ministry opportunities I had through that, with the, the awesome speakers and the things that I learned from there, and the relationships I gained from going there. I went to college with a lot of those people that I went and met, and, you know, and it's just an awesome opportunity, but all those things cost money. And so we're trying to make sure that we've got some ability to raise some money for the teens, even as much as if we go snow tubing. It's like $35 a person to go snow tubing. So if we sell a couple things of soup, a team can go snow tubing if they might not otherwise have the opportunity, you know. And so all those things are some great things. Just heads up, we will be doing mulch coming up soon. Okay, last year we did a lot of mulch, and it was a great state. So if you know anybody right now who is interested in soup in any way, give them this, okay. If you have questions, uh, Julie can also, I, I've got them, Julie's got them online. I could send you an email. It, my email's really easy. It's just Josh Fretz at Hotmail. Okay, that's pretty easy to remember, Josh Fretz at Hotmail. Okay, and I can send you attachments that you can email out to people. But any, anything helps. Uh, we, we've been having a great time in youth, and uh, we just really, really appreciate your support, and I hope you enjoy soup. Yeah, so... Uh, ham pot pie is, is... Yeah, it's a different soup this time. And, and the teens are going to get to make the noodles. Wow. Yeah. All right. I, who's never had ham pot pie soup? Okay. I would be one of those. I, I did not even know it was a thing. It's like a Pennsylvania Dutch thing, That's isn't it? Why yeah. I didn't know it was a thing. Okay. Um, yeah. We don't make soup like that in Indiana. And yeah. So here's an opportunity for us to learn a little bit of culture and uh, looking forward to that. Um, okay, question. Do you need the plastic tubs back that cookie it, dough If you have them, we can use those too. All right. Yeah, because the youth purchased those, and, and if we just don't have to buy more of them, that means more money going into the team's pockets. All right, because we you totally know. plowed through the first one with a spoon. Yeah, I... Um, and we've, we've been over a period of like four hours. Um, no, I'm <laughs> kidding. It was more like four days. Um, but Six right, hours. So anything we can get back to you, that would be great. Uh, in the church email this week, we're going to try to get the QR code. We know we definitely can do that. I'd also like to link the video to Momentum Youth Conference, which I believe is out there because registration is opening or has opened. It has opened. Okay. Along and, with yeah. camp, camp as well. Yep. I know Jess just was giving out some camp dates and details for kiddos on the younger side of things. So like it's January and we're talking summer, um, which means it's going to get warm soon, which is awesome. Mm. Um, so this leads me to my last thing. Um, if you did not get an email from the church office last Wednesday, you might not be signed up on the email list. And so everything we just talked about sending you wouldn't come to you. Um, additionally, if you did not get a text message last Sunday morning that said, we're not meeting, it actually was two because we did cancel Sunday school first and then we came back and did the worship service, then you're not signed up for text messaging reminders. And that information is right there on the screen, if you text at Borough Grace to that number, that will sign you up. My phone will start dinging here as some of you are doing that. We'll get you signed up and in there. And uh, we primarily use that for like weather stuff. It's just one of the fastest ways. Um, but then if there are other things along the way, we can hit those as well. Church email, if you need to get signed up for that, um, in your bulletin, there is a smaller QR code at the bottom of the page that has Josh's big QR code. Small, that will do the same thing. Big. It'll take you to a sign-up page. If you run analog and your phone maybe doesn't automatically link into QR codes through the camera app, 
um, just find one of us and say, hey, here's my email. I'd love to get signed up, and we'll make sure that that happens too. All right? I think we did it. All right. One, one more thing. Thought of one more thing. Um, flashlight tag. Yes. Or not flashlight tag. Ooh, that would be fun. <laughs> uh, that's for you. Um, <laughs> you can do that. Um, <laughs> flashlight scavenger hunt um, around Easter time. We are looking for plastic Easter eggs as well as egg cartons. Yes. So those of you who eat eggs, I'll take your egg cartons. Um, oh, come on, Amy. Um, so back next to the offering box in the foyer, there's a bin. So if you just want to throw any plastic eggs you may have or egg cartons in there, we would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Going once? So what? Would you stand and say good morning and welcome to those around you? Yeah. if you could make your way back to your seats. It's like we haven't hung out for two weeks, and I hate to be that guy, but uh, we got to do it. Actually, I think the ambient noise just got a little louder at that moment. Uh, all right, so if you can head back to your seats and grab your Bibles while you do, you're going to want to grab them and head on over to, uh, to Hebrews. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 5 to seven here this morning, and um, what we're doing here this morning is obviously continuing this journey we began two weeks ago in the book of Hebrews that is going to take us every bit of this calendar year, and we're planning to move it into 2023 as well. Now, the Lord may have different plans, and that's certainly fine. He gets to call those shots, but as it is standing and on paper at the moment, that's what we're looking at, and and uh, we want to be thinking about just what the writer of Hebrews, who we don't know the name of, wrote to the audience of Hebrews, who we don't know where they came from. And so there's some interesting challenges to the book of Hebrews, as opposed to the book of First Peter, for example, where Peter writes... First Peter, and he addresses the book of First Peter to a particular region of people, and so you can identify some things like, oh, they're from there, and historically this might have been part of what was going on, and here's what we know about Peter and his life and ministry and all of those types of things we get to draw from. The writer of Hebrews is unknown, and there's lots of ink and lots of pages and lots of opinions about who the writer of Hebrews is is we're not going to spend our time trying to figure that out here this morning nor in our series um, but we do know a little bit about the audience that we can infer from the content that was written one of the things that we can i think confidently understand is that the audience of the book of hebrews the hebrews had an extensive knowledge of the old testament they knew the left side of their bible and they probably knew it better than we know it. And so we're going to be trying to play a little bit of catch-up work. Because as the writer is writing, he is going to, and we'll see this today, just begin dropping scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture in and from the book or the books of and multiple places in the Old Testament. And really, I think the assumption behind and underneath all of that is, you guys know these scriptures. Let me show you and tell you about how Jesus is greater through them. And he just begins what is often referred to in verse 5 as a string of pearls, seven different quotations from the Old Testament, all making the point Jesus is greater than the angels. And that's really the big idea that he has all the way through chapter 2. And the writer is wanting his audience to understand some things about who Jesus is and that Jesus is greater. So I told you two weeks ago that as a theme, we want to be thinking about Jesus is greater this year. And we want to do so and we want that phrase to be a 
to be before us and in front of us. We want to be hearing it. And I told you that my goal was to say it or have you hear it 250 times over the course of this year. Apparently, I said it 25 times in that sermon two weeks ago all by itself. So Josh is like, you're 10% of the way on your goal because the math teacher over there is calculating these things. And my thought was, if I've already accomplished 10% of my goal, we should increase the goal by 90%. So 2,500 is now the goal of you and I hearing the phrase, Jesus is greater, and we could not do any better than to just be reminding ourselves continually, week in and week out, time and time again, about the greatness of Jesus. Because here's kind of what's underneath all of that and underneath the book of Hebrews, because there really was genuine angst with this group. Okay, they, they were culturally, ethnically Jewish. That seems pretty clear from what is written. They had extensive knowledge and extensive understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. That seems pretty clear from what was written. And there is some really specific and clear warnings that you and I can infer in and through that they were really wondering just how great is this Jesus? Because the cost of following him seems to be increasing. The heat seems to get turned up a little bit. And if they were ethnically Jewish and living anywhere in and around the Roman Empire and its vassal states and extensive reach, more than likely what they were experiencing was the early rise of Christian persecution. Judaism provided a, a bit of a safety net as it was, as it was in the nation of Rome and the vassal territories it had because it was a legally recognized religion. Christianity Christianity wasn't really until Constantine came and began giving leadership in Rome. But then you probably have the family cost that comes along with it. Where all of these ethnically Jewish people would have grown up hearing about the Messiah, would have grown up reading all of these Old Testament scriptures becoming familiar with all of these stories and being reminded of how God had worked in and through the nation of Israel and the lives of Jacob and Abraham and Isaac and Moses and David and all of these promises that God had made all through his scriptures. And now the name Jesus is given. And there wasn't widespread agreement amongst the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah. They crucified him because he claimed to be. And they denied his claim. And so even within the family, there probably was a little bit of heat getting turned up along the way. And so the point the author makes beginning in chapter 1 verse 5 and really through all of chapter 2 is that Jesus is greater than the angels. And we'll look this morning at verses 5, 6, and 7 and think of Three specific ways that the author proves the point he makes in verse 4. So I want to read verses 1 to 4, and then I want to pray, and then we'll hop into 5 to 7, and we'll try to get ourselves kind of reoriented into what the author is saying. Two weeks ago, in verses 1 to 4, we looked at 10 different ways the author says Jesus is greater. In the last two, 9 and 10, are about the angels. And what he's going to do is he's going to take that statement about Jesus' greatness over against the angels, and he's going to start to prove his point. And he proves his point by drawing from the Old Testament to say, look, the scriptures you believe are authoritative, that you believe God inspired, the very people that you think God has always worked through, they talk about this guy, and his name is Jesus, and he is greater. So let's look at verses 1 to 4 together. Just try to reorient ourselves. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, 
having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Would you pray with me? Well, God in heaven, we now pause and bow before you as the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has spoken in, his la- in these last days by the Son. And we ask that you would help us to see more clearly this morning how Jesus is greater. And as we think about his greatness in relationship to the angels, it's probably often something we don't pause to consider And yet that's exactly what you tell us in and through your word as you inspired this servant, this author to write this sermon. And so we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That our minds would understand, that our hearts would believe, and that our lives would reflect these truths. God, thank you that Jesus came. Our Savior, our Redeemer, the one by which and in which we find eternal life. And we have this morning already sung these truths as we look now in your word as the ultimate source of truth, we pray that you would help us to see them even more clearly and understand even more who Jesus is and just how great he is. And we pray this in his good name, amen. So it's in verse 4 that the author really introduces the idea of angels, and it's really just kind of made as a statement in passing that Jesus has a name that's much superior to the angels, and then in verse 5, he begins to prove his point, and he does so from the Old Testament scriptures. And so 5, 6, and 7, we'll just look at them together here for a moment. He writes, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he said, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And so this introduction to uh, the, the greatness of Jesus in regards to or in comparison to the angels is really interesting. And in chapter 2, we'll look at it in several weeks from now, where the author writes that the angels were a part of delivering the message that was in the Old Testament. It's part of the bigger idea that he's trying to get across. That Look, if you listened to what God said in the Old Testament as it was delivered by angels to the prophets or through the prophets to the fathers. Now, you should listen to what those angels delivered because they said some things about the greatness of Jesus. And they said themselves, as God did in the Old Testament, that Jesus is greater. And what we see in verse 5 is that the first point the author makes is that the angels are not the Son. Jesus is the Son. So they're the question posed is, to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? The implied answer to the question is, well, to none, but let's think here for a little bit and just perhaps pause in Hebrews, because I want us to just maybe pull aside and think about What are some things regarding the angels? Here's kind of an odd introduction of a whole group or class of created beings that the author seems to just kind of assume his audience kind of knew a whole lot of stuff about. 
and yet it, they're not really whom we spend a lot of time talking about. It, last month, we, I'm sure, talked about Gabriel coming in announcing to Mary that the birth was going to happen, and we thought through how the wise men were instructed to not go back by the way of Herod in a dream, and we can, uh, can see the angelic activity around the incarnation of Jesus, but I just want to give you very quickly a brief sketch regarding angels as we step into what amounts to be chapters 1 and 2 that are about angels. The first thing is that angels are created beings. They are created beings. It's in Colossians chapter 1 that we read that for by him, this is Jesus Paul's writing about, All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. I mean, it's pretty clear here that Jesus created all things. That corresponds exactly to what the author of Hebrews said, through whom he also created the world. But we thought two weeks ago about how that word world is much more broadly or perhaps much more appropriately understood as everything. Like the universe, what the James Webb is trying to peer into the depths of here in the next few months, Jesus created it all. Well, those are things visible and invisible. Those were the angelic host. They are created beings. Now, we don't know exactly what day of creation they were created. Probably before Adam and Eve were created. Certainly before the end of day six, when God said it's very good, and then he rested. But the angels were created and are created beings. They are moral beings. Angels are moral beings. They have a capacity to choose good. They have a capacity to choose evil. Some of them, we know from the scriptures, chose evil. They chose rebellion against evil. The Lord. And so there's these descriptors that show up different places in the Old Testament regarding the holy angels or the fallen angels or the evil. There's these words that are all moral in their orientation. And here in Mark, Jesus is saying, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes. In the glory of his Father with the holy angels. There's a lot that Mark 8 has to say. We're just kind of showing ourselves that the term holy angels here is in the words of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Peter, in his second epistle, references judgment that came upon the angels that rebelled. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Well, Peter's going to go on and say, uh, how do you guys think you're going to fare any better? Or how do these false teachers and false prophets think that they're going to fare any better? And it, it, it seems as if, and again, we're not deeply exploring the angelic host this morning. It seems as if there is a group of angels that have been bound in hell and gloomy judgment right now. But then there's still a group that are rather free. And they're opposed to the very things of God. And they are still setting themselves against the face of God and trying to actively work against him. And you see those on display in the ministry and life of Jesus where he comes as God and has authority over them. They recognize him as God. They often say, this wasn't the time, right? Like we're still wanting to be about thwarting your business and You can kind of see some of the exchange and interplay between Jesus and the demons or the fallen angels, however you might term them. The point here is that they're moral beings. They're created beings. They are moral beings. Thirdly, they're emotional beings. There's an emotional response that we see through the scriptures that angels have. Jesus in Luke 15 says, as he wraps up one of the parables he tells about lost things becoming found, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, joy is an emotion. They're emotional beings. They're intellectual beings. They have a capacity for thought. They probably are a whole lot more intellectual than we are, and they're of a higher created class than we are. 
They are intellectual beings. Peter, in his first epistle that we looked at some time ago, talks about how the gospel had been revealed to the Old Testament prophets, and the angels are longing to look into the details to understand more fully the things of Christ. So there's some things the angels understand, there's some things that they don't understand, and it was the Holy Spirit that was empowering the preaching of the good news that was sent from heaven, and they were the things in which the angels longed to look. They really wanted to understand more of the details. The, our point is that they were intellectual beings. Angels, though, are also non-physical beings, yet there are points in time in which they will take on physical characteristics, but they are non-physical Beings. One of my favorite passages of scripture in the Old Testament comes from 2 Kings chapter 6. And the scene is Elisha and a servant find themselves surrounded by a physical army that are coming and waiting to wage war. And the servant's having one of those moments that is probably like you and I would have where he's just kind of freaking out like, oh my goodness, we are done. Like, that's it. It's over. And Elisha... Praise, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And so the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains, mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. Now, if that phrase brings a song to mind, please don't start singing it. They're non-physical beings. They're created, they're moral they're intelligent, they're emotional, they're non-physical. The point the author of Hebrews is making is that the angels are not the Son. Jesus has inherited or has become much superior to the angels because the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. The angels are not the Son. Jesus is the Son. So what he does is he begins this string of pearls, this first of seven Old Testament quotations through the end of chapter 1 where he tries to make his point over and over and over again using the very scriptures that this group of people would have understood as authoritative and he says look to which of the angels did God ever say you are my son today I have begotten you well the answer is he didn't to any of them the angels are not the Son. Jesus is the Son. It's interesting that there's only three named angels in the scriptures that we can find. Michael is named a archangel. That's kind of a title that he's given, but he shows up in Daniel. He shows up in Jude, and he shows up in Revelation. Gabriel shows up in Daniel and shows up as well in Luke. And then Satan or Lucifer or the devil would be the third angel that we are given a name of. But here's one of the points of contrast that we even see in our world today that the author of Hebrews is giving very clear indication and instruction regarding. Okay, there is a belief among the Jehovah's Witnesses that Michael, the archangel, and Jesus are the same person. That they look at uh, the different places in the old and the new, and they see Michael commanding the angelic armies, and they see Jesus commanding the angelic armies, and they go, well, it's, no, it's not said anywhere that they're not the same person, so they must be the same person. And they put those things together. Well, the point the author of Hebrews is making is that the angels are not the son. Michael is not the son. Gabriel is not the son. Jesus is the Son. And one of the really simple ways to perhaps just understand the relationship between Michael and Jesus is how we just see in our own nation the relationship between the commander and the chief and his top general. Okay? The commander in chief is not the top general of the armed forces. The general is the general, the commander in chief is the commander in chief. They're not one and the same. But do they both have command over the armed forces? Well, absolutely they do. But they're not the same person. The author of Hebrews is saying the angels are not the son. Jesus is 
the Son. And what he does in quoting from Psalm 2 is he begins to use royal imagery, royal passages from the Old Testament to show the enthronement of Jesus as the Son. And so he goes to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, where the psalmist, who we will learn from Peter in Acts 4, is David, writes, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Our English Bibles capitalize the word son there because you read that and there's a sense that there's something a little bit more going on here than just the Lord speaking to David. Well, the New Testament apostles certainly understood this to be a psalm, a messianic psalm, a royal psalm about the enthronement and inauguration of Jesus as king. So Psalm 2 is about inauguration day or coronation day, as Elsa and Anna would have understood it to be. And the point of Psalm 2 is that no matter what the enemies around do, God through his king will reign victorious. And that certainly went through the line and lineage of David. That is announced by the angel Gabriel to Mary that he will be of his father David and will sit on his father's throne. And there's all of this son, kingly expectation of coronation and inauguration language that is used to describe the arrival of Jesus. However, the enthronement of Jesus more than likely has to do with the resurrection and then later ascension and enthronement of Jesus when, as the author of Hebrews tells us, he sat at the right hand of the majesty on high. And it's in Acts chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, that I believe it's Paul that's speaking. It says, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers... There the word fathers is a reference to the Old Testament fathers. All of the guys that God was speaking to and proclaiming these things to in the Old Testament that God has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. The word begotten is figurative language used to refer to the preeminent status of Jesus. Now here's the thing. Jesus did not become the Son of God at this moment. Jesus did not somehow become eternal or God himself at this moment. He has always existed eternally as God. He is the one who created all things and as God upholds all things by the word of his power. But here's another point of great distinction between what we believe the Bible to teach and what the Mormons would say the Bible teaches. And I want to quote from from their website regarding this because it it, it matters and fits with what the point the author of Hebrews is making. They write, we believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Father. To that we could say yes and amen. Here's where we begin to have some distinguishment. And as such, inherited powers of godhood and divinity from his father, including immortality, the capacity to live forever, to which we would say absolutely not. He did not inherit anything from God his father. He has always been and will always be one with the father. He is the preeminent, exalted one by whom and for whom and through whom all things are created. He inherited nothing. He has always existed with all things in his disposal and at his command. It goes on. He possessed the powers of a God and ministered as one having authority, including power over the elements and even power over life and death. Again, he was not granted those things. He has those things. Because he is not a created being. He is the Son. The angels are not 
the Son. Jesus is the Son. He is the only one who has the right to sit on David's throne in fulfillment of what God declared he would do. And that's the next quotation the author of Hebrews tells us as he says, Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And here the author quotes from 2 Samuel 7.14. He's talking to David here through the prophet Nathan. And he says, I will be to him a father. Now, he's talking about David's offspring. In the near context, there's no question that he's talking about Solomon. And certainly as the discipline language comes in, Solomon's the one in view here because Solomon's life ended quite badly as did the kingdom that was under his rule and reign as well, because he committed iniquity. Well, none of that was going to be committed by Jesus, but you have as well in 2 Samuel the promise to David, what we would understand as the Davidic covenant, that there would be an heir of David who would sit on David's throne forever. This is where the son language then becomes kind of full circle, and the promise that there will be forevermore an heir of David to sit on his throne is what the author of Hebrews is, is saying here in quoting 2 Samuel seven fourteen is that Jesus is that son. The angels are not the son. Jesus is the son. Paul makes that point in the very beginning of Romans, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, where he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Again, left side of your Bible, the gospel was promised concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. His name is Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is the point the author of Hebrews is trying to make. The angels are not the Son. Jesus is the Son. Jesus is greater because he is the Son. The only one with the right and authority to sit on the throne and do so in fulfillment of the promise that God made to David. In some ways, David's not specifically mentioned, but I think there's a subtle working in here that Jesus is greater than David in the midst of making the point that he's greater than the angels. Well, secondly, the next big idea the author writes is that the angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. Worship, Thinking along the lines of how Jesus is greater, it is not the angels who will be worshipped. Rather, it is the angels who will be worshippers. And in verse 6, the author writes, And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Now that's a quotation probably from Deuteronomy 32, 43, but Psalm 97 verse 7 picks up on that Deuteronomy 32 quotation, and this quoting, it follows a lot more closely the Psalm 97 verse 7 quotation, okay? So there's some things that took place when the psalmists were borrowing language from the Old Testament, and then the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, and Psalm 97 in its Greek translation fits very well with what the author is using here. The point is, in the midst of all of that detail, that the angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship, and it is the angels who will worship Jesus, not the other way around. Now, in the midst of this, and in the beginning introduction to this quotation that shows up in verse 6, there's a considerable amount of debate about what type of arrival we're talking about. Because the idea of arrival, bringing the firstborn, is in the midst of verse 6. Those words show up. The, The arrival of Jesus is right there in view. But what arrival are we talking about? There are some that believe it's the incarnation of Jesus when they let the angels worship him, which they certainly did. 
There are others in which I'm inclined to lean towards that believe that this is a reference to the coming arrival of Jesus. And the bringing firstborn language here is an expression of the return of Christ when he will come back. And the scene, if you will, that, the, that I believe the author of Hebrews is kind of trying to paint for us is of perhaps Jesus entering a stadium where the whole angelic host has been seated and is just cheering on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is coming again to fully and finally care for all things. The angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. The word firstborn is a, an expression, it's a, a word that refers to the special status. Again, preeminence here is a good word as well. Perhaps even legal language in the sense of when you look at the, the rights of a firstborn son... There's different rights, different responsibilities that are conferred. But it wasn't always conferred directly to the actual biologically firstborn son. Here, the author is making the point that Jesus exists in a preeminent status. And the angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. Did they worship him when he came the first time? Absolutely I think the scene here is that they will worship him when he returns again. And part of God's plan is to have the son return. Not as a baby, but as a ruling king. As one who will put an end to sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. The angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. And so Jesus is greater than the angels. The third quotation, the third big idea that the author gives to us shows up in verse 7. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers flames of fire. That's a quotation, rather direct quotation from Psalm 104 verse 4. And that psalm, as Duane read for us this morning, is a psalm that ascribes sovereignty to God over all things. All things created. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless, O Lord, my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a garment. Just, just. Pause and just think of that imagery for a moment. That light is like a garment. Just think of what the psalmist is trying to get our minds to kind of wrap around and, and, and picture as we just think about the, the greatness and the majesty of God. That like this sweater I am wearing, light wraps around him like a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds and his ministers a flaming fire. The point is that the angels are servants. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus is greater because he's the one who is directing his angels, his messengers, his ministers to go work on his behalf for his glory and the good of his people. Now, at the end of this month, on January 30th, we're going to revisit that idea in a little bit more detail as we look at the end of chapter 1, where it re the author says the angels are ministering servants. But Jesus is greater than the angels because they're the servants that serve the sovereign. 
And the third quotation the author of Hebrews gives us from Psalm 104 is a quotation from a passage ascribing the totality of God's sovereignty over all things, which includes the very servants that he sends and uses for his glory and the good of his people. And so Jesus is greater. He's much superior than they are because the name that he's inherited, which is probably the name son or the title son, is much more excellent than theirs because the angels are not the son. Jesus is the son. And the angels are not worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. And the angels are servants while Jesus is. Is sovereign. This is the greatness of Jesus as the author begins to write about how he is so much superior to the angels. I asked Damien and Brenda and Larry if they could play for us and lead us in singing Fairest Lord Jesus and close this morning. I love one of the verses in that hymn. I think it kind of harkens back to Psalm 104, perhaps. But it's fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines purer than all the angels in heaven can boast. And here in the author of Hebrews, in the whole book of Hebrews, it's a pastor pleading with his people to not forget the greatness of Jesus. In the midst of whatever it is, in whatever situation, and whatever the details are that they find themselves having to walk through and navigate, that Jesus is greater. And he does so by beginning and revisiting this point he makes, that he's greater than the angels. Because they're not the son, he is the son. They're not worthy of worship. He alone is worthy of worship. And they are servants. And he is sovereign. Would you stand as they lead us in song here at the end? Oh uh-huh.
Well, Lord, we just, uh, we praise you this morning. We thank you that Jesus is higher than the angels, that he is and always has been your son, and that he sits on his throne ruling. We just pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week, and we hope to see you again next week. Thanks again for joining us, and be sure to